great day to be in church together. Let's stand to our feet all across this place. We're going to worship the Lord together today.
together today. Come on. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things I've seen and this reckoning. I know. to the graven image, to the idol that represented the king, they would not bow. They said they would not follow the ways of the world. So the king said, I'm gonna throw you guys into the fire. There's a furnace over here, it's hot. I'm gonna throw you guys in there, so good luck. And when he did, they saw that there was someone in the fire with them. And they came out of that fire completely untouched, completely unharmed. There is no promise, church, that if we get thrown into the fire or if we get thrown into the storm, there is no promise that we will come out untouched. But there is a promise that in every situation, however painful that you might be walking through today, the promise is that God is with you in the midst of that fire, that God is with you in the midst of that storm. That is the promise that we have. So God, today, we say with faith, just like those Hebrew young men did back in Daniel chapter three, we say that we serve a God who can deliver us we serve a God who will deliver us. But even if you don't, that will not change the fact that we will not follow the ways of this world. We have made a decision and we will follow you wherever you lead, Jesus. You are with us. You have made a promise to never leave us or forsake us. And God, whatever situations are represented today in this room, however painful, God, those that are dealing with physical pain, those that are dealing with relational pain, mental pain, God, whatever it may be, would you reveal yourself? Would you show each and every one of us, God, that you are there in every situation, in every moment. And God, because of that, we will put our trust 
in you. It's in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Church, if you're thankful that we serve a God who is with us in every season, in every moment, would you give him praise today? Amen. So good to worship with you today. Hey, before you're seated, find a couple people around you, maybe introduce yourself, give them a fist bump, and then you may be seated. Well, hey, good morning, Cornerstone. How are you guys doing? You guys doing well this morning? Two, three, three of you doing well. We're praying for the rest of you. No, it's too late. It's too late. Too late. I'll be praying for the rest of you. Hey, my name is Rowan. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. Uh, I'd just like to take a quick moment and welcome all of you, whether you're here in person or if you're watching online. We truly are grateful that you are here with us uh, today. If you're, if you're new here, I want to extend a special welcome to you. We're very excited that you decided to spend this part of your morning here with us. Uh, I'd also like to invite you to text the word new uh, to 951-425-4425. We have a special gift for you. That's just our way of saying thank you so much for being here with us uh, this morning. Now, it's October, which means it's fall. Anybody else love fall weather? I love fall weather. I got my jacket on. It's pumpkin spice season. We're good. We're good. October's a great month for the entire world because of pumpkin spice, really. Uh, but it's a special month here at Cornerstone. We have a lot of fun things happening this month. Uh, today, we have our first of five pastor hangout events, pastor hangouts. Now, these events are really just low-key. We really value relationships here at Cornerstone. And so this is just another opportunity for, for the pastoral staff here at Cornerstone to get to hang out with you and your family. And we'd love to do that. And so uh, today's theme is like a Hawaiian barbecue or something. Next week, we're tailgating the Rams versus Cowboys game out on the, um, I like to call them the Star Girls, Star Girls, you know, not Cowboys, but Star Girls. Um, first service thought it was funny, okay? You guys, a lot of Cowboys fans in here, jeesh. Uh, Rams versus Cowboys out in small church next week. And so that's, those are two of five events. We're going to have a lot of fun at these events. And so I'd encourage you, if you want to hang out with us, text the word hang out to that number on your screen. We'll send you a link so you can check out all the events that are happening and you and your family can decide which one do you want to join us at. Also, October means Halloween is right around the corner. And I love Halloween. It's such a fun time, here, especially here at Cornerstone. This year, we're doing a trunk or treat. And if you've ever been to any of the trunk or treats we've had in the past, you know these are a lot of fun. These are great opportunity for you to invite your friends, your neighbors, your family members who might be skeptical about church. This is a great opportunity, great event for you to invite them uh, to come out. We're going to have a lot of trunks that are decorated, filled with candy for the kids, goal is to get every kid at least two cavities by the end of the night. That is our goal as a church. Uh, so lots, lots and lots of fun candy. There's a band, food. It's just going to be really, really fun. So make sure you guys come out. But that being said, we need people to decorate their trunks and we need a lot of candy. And so if you want to partner with us, you can text the word TREAT to 951-425-4425. Or if you purchase candy, you can just drop it off on the patio any Sunday uh, during the month of October. We'll be more than happy to take that candy and make sure we get it into your kids' mouths. We're going to go into a time of giving. And here at Cornerstone, we also believe that this is a, a, a special time because your giving is what empowers us Cornerstone empowers many ministries at Cornerstone to go out and reach people and make a difference in the lives of people here within our community and around the globe. And so as you give, I hope that you are reminded and you are encouraged that your giving really is making a huge difference in the lives of so, so many people just here and also around the world through our global missions partner. So uh, would you guys pray with me? Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being good to us. Lord, we pray for our tithes and offering. I pray that you bless them, that you multiply them, Lord, that you keep using them for your kingdom impact, Father. Lord, we pray these things in your precious name, and we all say amen.
Good morning. So, uh, what? I didn't hear it. Did someone yell something or am I losing my mind? All right, yell louder next time. Um, so we've got two whole roast pigs being delivered to our house today. Did you know you could order roast pigs like you order a pizza? This is, I mean, you don't have to dig a hole in your backyard at all. This is amazing. And so this is a game changer for us. But unfortunately, that's all. That all filled up. We're gonna have 80 people at our house today. <laughs> It wasn't supposed to be that much, but I messed up creating the form and made uh, kids unlimited. And so some of you have unlimited kids and it, <laughs> I real quick shut it off. Um, but the, all the events are gonna be a lot of fun. We wanna hang out with you guys. Uh, we want you to get to know the pastors here at the church. And so we're gonna try and be at as many of these events at, at po as possible. Now I'm smiling extra big today because um, the one event that pastors Aaron and Ryan are doing, it, it's a bowling and pizza is what they wanted to call it. It's at Pins and Pockets. So I've been joking for the last couple of weeks, we should call it Pins and Pastors. And everyone's shutting me down. Everyone's like, that's lame. That's a dumb jad joke. But somebody, somebody must have thought I was serious and they called the event Pins and Pastors. You like it, Pastor Aaron? What do you think? I should have let him think it was your idea. You're lame. Pastor of lame. That's what you do. So I'm, it made me really happy. <laughs> uh, unfortunately. All right. People need to stop listening to me. We're in our Life in Him series. We have two chapters left. Last week, Jesus was crucified for our sins. But that means he also paid the, our debt for us, right? Jesus paid it all. Today, we're going to see Jesus rise from the dead. And that has huge implications for the church. This literally is everything about what we do here at Cornerstone. If Jesus has not risen from the dead, then nothing we do really has any power or ability to help us or change anyone. Everything is about this chapter. He needed to die for our sins, but if he wasn't raised from the dead, how would we even know if it worked? Like if God honored that, if you know, we would have a dead savior, but we have a living savior. I wanna start by showing two quotes that remind us of how important this chapter is. The first is by Tim Keller. It says, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. Right? We're going to find things in the scriptures where God commands us to do something that we don't wanna do because we are humans and he is God and he knows what's best for us and we're always fighting against that. But if he actually rose from the dead, we need to listen, right? Then this is all real, it's not just good advice. Adrian Rogers said, the resurrection is not merely important to the historic Christian faith. Without it, there would be no Christianity. It is the singular doctrine that elevates Christianity above all other world religions. I had a lot of fun looking at some different quotes, got a little carried away, so we actually put 10 other powerful quotes on that page. If you go to, go to cornerstone.com slash resurrection, you can read these quotes that just, they fill you with faith. They build you up and remind you of how important this chapter really is. The disciples are going through all sorts of different emotions with Jesus being dead, right? They just don't know how to process their leader dying. And even on the day of the resurrection, they're experiencing confusion, grief, fear and doubts about what, what is going on and what's happening. And we experience all those things throughout our life, right? And we're gonna see how we can persevere through all of those kinds of moments as we see these disciples still following Jesus and trying to figure it all out. Because now we have, we have a new perspective and we have the presence of God with us as we go through these common things. God doesn't promise us we will not go through these situations, but that he is with us when we do go through them. And so we're gonna see what the resurrection means to us today. We're in John chapter 20. If you have a Bible, you can turn there or you can open up the app and I'll follow along as well. But John chapter 20, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. This is, this is the author, John, that is, um, being anonymous for some reason here, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. What a guy. 
right? Like only a man would include that in the scriptures. But you gotta give Peter a break here. He's going through a hard time. He had just betrayed Jesus, had his appendix removed, moved a piano for a neighbor and had a herniated disc. And so Peter is, Peter is, of course he wasn't first, but you know, he bent over and looked at, in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him, this guy's really rubbing it in, and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, by the way, who had reached the tomb first, in case you missed that, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. The resurrection means that we do not have to let confusion discourage us. The disciples, the key people, are confused up and down about this whole situation. They, they are nothing but confusion as they're trying to process what's going on. And so we should expect confusion. Confusion is different than doubting. With confusion, you're saying, I believe, I still believe in Jesus. I just don't know how this other thing works out in scripture or in my life, right? We can be confused about what God wants us to do next, where we should live, where we should work, what the next move is. And we want God to tell us, but we're just confused about it. It's a normal experience that we all go through. Mary was confused. And what I love about her response is she didn't keep it to herself and she didn't isolate herself. She ran to her spiritual community. She ran and told Peter and John what she was confused about. I don't know how to process this. She's saying, you know, like he's not there. I don't know where they've, they've taken him. And she brings her confusion to her spiritual community. And that's a great example for us, right? We shouldn't just wrestle with things by ourselves. We should bring it to others in the body of Christ. And so it's a great time to do that because Life Groups launched last week. And so there's still six or seven weeks left in Life Groups. And so it's a good time to jump in, right? There's Life Groups for all different kinds of studies and days of the week that you can join into. But your experience shouldn't be um, oh yeah, I'm at a big church and it feels big and I don't feel connected. You're at a larger church, but then we need to get connected. You can't just stay in, in a larger church disconnected from other people or you won't experience growth. We need a spiritual community where we can share our confusion and our hurts with each other. Mary does just that. For John and Peter, they allowed confusion to lead them to a deeper research of what's going on. Right, they, they, they ran in and they looked around and there was something about how the cloth that was wrapped around the body of Jesus was there, different from the linen that caused John to believe, but Peter was still really confused about it. And keep in mind, this is we'll see it more in the story as it goes on. It, maybe it was pretty dramatic where Jesus rose in his glorified body through the cloth, and it might have still looked like a mummified remain there with the linen of, that was wrapped around his head, wrapped and put down. Something about it was so different that it caused John to believe and Peter to still wonder. And often confusion is due to a lack of knowing the Bible. Verse nine says they were confused because they just didn't understand yet all the Old Testament prophecies that talked about the death and resurrection of the Messiah. And so as we continue to get into the scriptures and we throw ourselves into the study of scriptures, we'll have less and less confusion in life. And so I'm so grateful this year we launched the Explore the Bible class that's going through all the books of the Bible. Today they start Jonah. It happens during this service. So those that attend either go to the 9 a.m. or the 11.40 a.m. service and, and jump in for this. But it's a great study that, that takes about an hour to just kind of wrestle through the scriptures. And the more we know the word, the less room there is for confusion. So that's a great opportunity for us. Now we see another meaning of the resurrection in verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? Well, they've taken away the Lord. I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. 
Jesus said, do not hold on to me or do not cling to me, many translations say, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the to disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that, she, that he had said all these things to her. Because of the resurrection, we don't have to let grief beat us. She's, she's kind of paralyzed there in her grief. John and, and, and Peter leave her and she doesn't wanna go with them. She just needs to sit there and cry. And sometimes you just feel like, I just can't even move because of the sadness that I'm, that I'm going through right now. And weeping over death, loss, pain, and evil, she thinks someone stole his body, some cruel joke that they were doing. That's common and that's normal. That's an appropriate response in grief is to have those kinds of emotions. Mary had them, she's weeping and she doesn't know what to do. The Bible doesn't say, don't grieve. The Bible doesn't say, suck it up, don't grieve, hold it in. The Bible tells us to grieve, but not like those that don't have hope. To grieve differently because things are different because of the good news. The Apostle Paul says, do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Just like Jesus was risen from the dead, those that have gone on before us and died will be raised again to newness of life. Now, Jesus told this to people in John chapter 11 when he gave them a preview of his resurrection by raising Lazarus. He gives Mary and Martha, whose brother had died, and they are weeping. He gives them this encouragement. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Do you believe me? And that's an important question for us to ask ourselves when we are grieving is, do we believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, that there is a hope for those that die in Christ? But it is a, it's a confusing time when we're going through grief, isn't it? It can be discouraging and long, and we don't know where to turn, and so I'm thankful at the church here we have a grief share class. For those that are going through grief and not knowing what to do next, there are people that are going through some curriculum that can help you with that. Because what do you do? When we lost our first child in the womb and it was devastating for us, um, we didn't know what to do, so we bought a couple books, we read through those, we decided to read through all the Psalms at a quicker pace, and we kind of just cried through the Psalms for months, and it was months of doing that, and people had their own opinions on when we should be done grieving and how that all looked, and we were just trying to figure it out, not necessarily on our own, because the community came around us to support us, but we didn't know what to do. Grief Share is a great place to figure this out. Mary's weeping because of the death of Jesus and potential evil that she's seeing, and that's normal. We were in New Jersey a couple weeks ago, eating some pizza, and, uh, and it was just a good night. We were gathered, we were gathered around a campfire. There's there no fireflies this time of year, um, but I'm with my family. I have three sisters in New Jersey. We're gathered together, and my little sister came over and, and whispered to me and said, Shannon's inside the house crying. I, I was like, what did I, so I'm kind of going through a list of what have I done? What did I do? What did I say? And I was pretty confident. I was like, all right, it might've been that thing. But when I went inside and just saw how heartbroken she was, I knew something devastating had happened. And, and she told me that she found out at that moment that her dad has cancer. And that was, that was rough news to hear far away from her dad who lives here in Marietta around us. And so the weeping was normal in that situation. Shannon's crying, her mom's crying, and, and eventually, um, her mom asked that I would, I would pray for them. And I get on the phone and before I could pray, Shannon's dad, Ken, said, hey, before, before you pray, I want you to know, I have a peace from God. God has given me a peace. And that's not, that's not normal. The weeping and crying is normal. The peace from God is not normal, but we can expect it. We can't, we can't feel it in advance. Like God's not going to give you hypothetical grace and mercy as you think of worst case scenarios. Okay, this is how God's gonna meet me if things go bad. But when you actually get to those worst case scenarios, God gives us peace. God helps us with our grief. And what a testimony in the very first moment that he was able to say, God is with me and he's giving me peace. And that built me up in my faith. When Mary was, was hurting, uh, this is just a small application point, but I, I love what she did. She, she turns when she's done crying and just looks back into the tomb one more time. You could say that she was going back to the last place that she knew Jesus was. Looking back, he was there the last time. I just wish he was there again. And that's a great reminder for us when we're in our grief and we don't know what to do, 
and everything feels like it's not working, go back to the last place that you met Jesus. Put some worship music on. If the last time you felt his presence was when worshiping, go back to the scriptures and cry through them if that's the last time that you experienced your relationship with Jesus. Draw near to him in those moments. And God honored her continuing to seek after Jesus by showing that there were two angels there to help her. And so God promises to honor all of us in that. James 4, 8 says, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. God, God's just not gonna do the, I mean, he's adopted us into his family. He calls us his children. And in our small momentary moments of faith where we say, God, where are you? Are you there? He will draw near to us in those moments. He's not gonna keep distancing himself from us in those moments. He's looking for people of faith to draw near to him, especially in these moments. And in grief, we can miss God's presence and instead describe it as an absence. It's exactly what happens to Mary. She is seeing Jesus after this, but it's out of context. He's supposed to be dead and taken away. It's kind of like seeing your kindergarten teacher in Walmart. You're like, Mrs. Smith? You're not supposed to be here. The world isn't right. No, back to the class. It just feels wrong, right? Something about this is out of context until he says her name because Jesus says that a sheep knows their shepherd's voice. And so he says her name and she knows this is Jesus. But she didn't think he was there. He was standing right there and she was talking to him and she felt nothing. And that's what grief can do to us. It can blind us. It can numb us because of all the pain and all the high emotions. We can't even sense the Lord's presence, but we can trust the scriptures that say that God is especially near the brokenhearted, that he captures all of our tears in a bottle. He's there even when he doesn't feel like he is there. And so she continues to seek Jesus, thinking this is the gardener, and that persistence is rewarded with clarity when she knows that it's Jesus. And so she, she clings to him. The NIV says she holds on to him. Other translations say she, she just clinged to him and was not letting him go. I'm, I'm not letting you go this time. And his response to that is very different than you'd expect. He says, Mary, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now, if you look at that sentence, it's, it's worded in a way where the implication is, hey, Mary, right now, Go, go and tell the disciples, don't cling to me, let go. Even though that's an appropriate response. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. The implication is that once I ascend to the Father, you will be able to cling to me. And so the spiritual clinging to Jesus that we can do will feel so real that Jesus is comforting someone who loves him saying, hey, not yet, when I ascend to the Father, that's the time to hold on to me. I love that word cling, that means to adhere as if glued firmly, to hold on tightly or tenaciously, to have a strong emotional attachment or dependence, to remain or linger. Man, I wish that described my faith with Jesus. My relationship with him is I just don't wanna let him go. Sometimes it does and other times, I mean, I'll shut my Bible and be like, okay, good, I, I read the word. And I'll have a thought of saying like, oh, you should have like, you, kids aren't up yet. You should have an extended time of prayer. Like, you know, it's not just reading, you should talk to the Lord. I'll say, yeah, well, yeah, but I read. That, like, that, that was easy to accomplish. I'll, I'll, do the, I'll do that later. And I'll pop on the phone and start looking through things that aren't good for my soul, you know, the news and, and things like that, neutral things that just aren't gonna build me up in my faith. And in those moments, I realize I'm, I'm not clinging to Jesus. I'm saying, man, that was great, but I'm, I'm done for today. Not that daily devotion should last all day, but we are rewarded for moments that we linger in the presence of God. We will be rewarded in those moments. Now we also see with Mary here that when you're ready, and that timing can be different for everyone, when you're ready, comfort other people with the comfort that you've received from God. And in her timing, she runs and tells the disciples, Jesus is alive, I've seen him. And we're encouraged to do that. And it doesn't have to be right away in the very next moment, but we're encouraged in 2 Corinthians 1, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. When we go through a difficulty and God comforts us and gives us peace, part of the process is that we would pass that on. We don't wanna see people hurting around us and so we wanna take that comfort and give it to others. And what's interesting is that it doesn't always have to be if you've gone through the same situation. It says, if God who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble. So your situation may be you know, cancer and medical and someone else may have a broken relationship. It doesn't mean you wait for someone else that's had that in the past to comfort them. You can still comfort them 
with how God has comfort in you, you can pass that on when the timing is right. The Holy Spirit will show you when it's right. And so two weeks ago when I told you I, I moved to piano and I have a little herniated disc, I got three emails that day of people saying, okay, here's what worked for me. Do these exercises, do these stretches. Have you tried less donuts? That one I deleted, that was spam. That one was spam, right? <laughs> the other ones, I was like, oh, I, I really appreciate how people are trying to say, here's how I was comforted. Here's, hopefully this will help you. That's what we should do spiritually as well. In verse 19, we see another common struggle that we go through in life. It says, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Because of the resurrection, we don't have to let fear paralyze us. We don't, it can be scary, life can be scary, right? And the disciples are gathering together afraid of the Jewish leaders. That's normal. That's a normal response that we can have when there's real fear out there that something is gonna go wrong. To flee to safety is a very normal response. Even when there's not a real fear out there, we can be, we can be afraid. When we were in New Jersey and we were driving the the sides of the roads on some of the highways are just like these deep forests. It might only go 30 feet, but it just, it's nothing you see in California. You can hide in that forest. It is, just gets dark. And, and so Titus is, is talking to us while I'm driving and he's looking out the window and he's like, dad, are there bears in New Jersey? I'm like, oh, yeah. and I didn't know why he was asking her. I wouldn't have given him so many details. I'm like, oh yes, yeah, son, lots of bears, bears everywhere. You know, I wasn't trying to scare him. I was just, I was thinking in the mountains and that one time where I saw a bear. Well, none of that helps a little kid who's scared of bears apparently. Because all, the, all of a sudden, I looked back while I was driving, super safe. I looked back and he's looking out the window, 30 feet from a dark forest, and he's leaning. He's got his little car seat, he's leaning like this. And then he closes his eyes. And he's just leaning over as if that would protect him. And so I told Shannon what was going on and we tried to comfort him that there's no, there's no danger. Um, there's more danger in me looking behind you right now than there is at a bear coming out of the woods, grabbing you. We had to tell Gideon to stop teasing him. He's like, yeah, that bear's gonna eat your head, you know? Now stop, Gideon. Leave him, leave him alone, you know? And so even when the fear isn't real, we can have fear and that's okay. Our mind is powerful. But I love what the disciples did because fear is better conquered together with others' support, right? And so they gather together in their fear. They get as many of the disciples together and they're talking about it and they're sharing how they're feeling, right? And so there's a real fear, but they're not going through it alone. They're together. That's one of the benefits of the spiritual communities that we're, we're asking everyone to be a part of here is that we want to go through life together with one another. And it's normal to be vulnerable and say, this is what scares me. And Jesus promises to show up when we gather like this and to give us his peace. And he did that. And he did that in a miraculous way. There, it, the Bible goes out of its way to, to share that the doors were shut this time and later in the story to remind us that, that Jesus, now that he's resurrected, has a, a glorified body. That doesn't mean he's like super ripped. It just means that he's able to pass through walls and just appear at, at certain moments. And he does here to show them his power. And Jesus promised that to the disciples before he even died. In Matthew chapter 18, he said, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. It's a promise that we have that as we gather together in our, in our time, the spirit of God is with us. That God is, that is with us as we fellowship and as we pray together. And in their moment, as they gathered together 10 strong, God was with them and he showed up. Now the peace was in his presence because they were in a private room. So they're scared, so they're in a private room. Jesus shows up and they're like, okay, if you're alive, we're not scared, but they weren't scared in a private room still. So Jesus goes on to say in verse, in verse 21, as, I, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. The implication is that the peace you have now, the courage you have now, you will have as you go out and now proclaim the truth because he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. It was at that moment they were born again. Now they still waited until the day of Pentecost to receive the power of the Holy Spirit to go in and do ministry that they were called to do. But now they were filled with the Holy Spirit so they could boldly proclaim the truth of the scriptures. Everything changes when God is with us. And here's the thing, 
If you're a follower of Jesus, then God is with you. He's with us. And so we can have courage and recognize because of the resurrection, what am I afraid of? I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. He is alive and well. My Savior did not die. He rose again. And so they proclaimed the truth powerfully. Their fear was overcome. But another emotion that we have as we go through life, and this is just as common, is doubt. Look at verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the 12, he wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord, but he said to them, well, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. And a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Because of the resur resurrection, we don't have to let doubts derail us. They don't have to like ruin our faith. Oh, I've got a doubt, that means I can't be a Christian. No, doubting can be a part of a season of believing in the Lord. It's not Thomas's fault that he had a different experience than everyone else. He wasn't in the room. Can you blame the guy? These are his closest friends, but this is also the craziest moment in history. So you can't blame the guy. And we have different experiences than the people around us. We've had different hurts and pain in life that we're trying to process with a loving God. And so people have different experiences. And I love that the disciples gave Thomas space and some time to process it. It was a week later before Jesus showed up for Thomas. That must've been a hard week where Thomas needed support from his friends. And they didn't block him from the meeting and say, oh, you don't believe, you can't be a part of this believers meeting since you don't believe. No, we don't see any of that kind of arguing. Instead, they continue a relationship with him. They continue to love him. And that's a great way for us to act around those that are doubting around us and saying, well, that doesn't change my love for you. You're not a project of mine to convince, to believe. I love you no matter what you're going through in this moment. Give space and time for healing, seven days. We can have doubts from tragedies in our life we can't explain, from difficult scriptures we don't understand, for the intersection between science and faith, and we're trying to figure out how that goes together, or when God is silent, we can have doubts. Do I really still believe that this is the truth? When Jesus shows up, notice, he isn't mad at doubters. He doesn't come and slap Thomas saying, you know, hey, why didn't you believe me? Come on, these are your friends. He's not mad at them at all. Instead, he tries to help Thomas. He says, hey, put your, put your finger here, reach, see with your eyes. Thomas was open to believing. He said, I will not believe unless I, I see this. And Jesus said, great, I'm going to show you the truth since you are seeking me honestly. Thomas hadn't seen the good research yet. It was understandable. Now he saw Jesus and Jesus encourages him to stop doubting and believe, but it is a gentle response. And listen, not only is questioning normal, it can be a pathway to a rich and vibrant faith. To, to say, oh, I have no questions about anything means you're not reading deeply enough or you just don't care about the answer there and it'll kind of sort it out. Like, it's okay to have questions, to try and sort out what this all means as we read the scriptures. And if that's where you're at today, where you have doubts about this, then I would encourage you to, to read a great book. I, I texted the author of this book. We're not friends, I'm not trying to name drop or anything. And he sent me back a really quiet message like he was in a room that he wasn't supposed to be talking. He's like, that's really great, you're sharing my book. And the church was weird. I didn't need to tell you that, but his, his book is When Faith Fails, Finding God in the Shadow of Doubt by Dominic Dunn. Great guy who had a season of serious doubting. And the church doesn't always handle that well. And so he's really quiet about it as he's trying to figure it out. And he wants to help others that are going through it. Written about his book, rather than viewing trust and doubt as incompatible, when faith fails, provides readers with a way to wrestle and ask questions while growing ever closer to God. You can move through doubt into a deeper, fuller faith, a faith that doesn't run from questions and the hard work of honest wrestling, but instead embraces the mysteries of belief. Don't just doubt, do the research. There's at least three other books I'd recommend to you to read in a season of doubting that can help make you feel a little bit less crazy. Like, yeah, this is a difficult passage of scripture. It is hard to reconcile these two things, but can still draw you closer to the Lord and make it a healthy thing. And finally, we see in these last couple of verses 
that the resurrection really means that our whole life can change, that there is power to change us, which is so encouraging. Verse 30, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. It's never just about inward belief, but about outward change, about bearing fruit where people can see the fruit of the Spirit bubbling up in you. You're a different person. For some that happens quicker than others, we're all on a different journey, but we need to be yielded to the Holy Spirit's work in our life. We need to agree with God and say, yes, I'm, I'm a sinner that needs to be more like Jesus. I wanna stop hurting people with my sin. I want to change. I wanna be a part of God's kingdom. That means living differently than the world says I should live. Kingdom living is different. And as we yield ourselves to a life in his name, everything changes because of the resurrection power that's available to us. And that power, I'll read one last verse, is described in Ephesians 1. His incomparable great power for us who believe, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. Do you hear what the Apostle Paul is saying in Ephesians? That the power that the Father used to raise his Son from the dead is available for us to use in daily living. We're able to overcome our grumpiness with our family, our frustrations with other people. When we lose our temper, when we go down that dark path that we know isn't good for us, we're able to overcome because of resurrection power. It's not like God gives you a little nudge and then, you know, it's, it's a big deal that the power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you. You should have hope. You can have courage. Doesn't matter how many times you've tried and you've failed to walk with the Lord, Resurrection power is available for those that call out for me and say, Lord, I need your help just for my ordinary life. Yeah, for big things I wanna do for you, but just my ordinary life, I need resurrection power if I'm going to honor you instead of honoring me and just going where my flesh wants to go. So let's ask God for that power because it's life-changing, life in his name. Father, we wanna have life in your name. We want our lives to be described as if it's in your name, that you're pleased with our lives. Well, we need power if we're gonna live like that. And Lord, just like we read in this moment the, that the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples, Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Lord, at that moment, they were indwelled by God and things were different, but they still waited for extra help from the Holy Spirit, Lord, and that's what we need. We need extra help from you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would just come upon us, that you would strengthen us, that you would give us what we need. Lord, resurrection power. It feels silly to apply it to not being grumpy with your family, Lord, but that's what it feels like we need because we're stuck in our patterns and our habits and we don't wanna be that way. So, Lord, help us. You've promised to show up. There's more than two or three gathered here now. Show up, Lord and give us each your power so that this week can be different than last week. We know that you will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I hope God's word encouraged you this morning like it encouraged me. It's kind of Easter Sunday at Cornerstone, reading about the resurrection, that's good news. We've got a prayer team available for you. Please come and let us pray for you. God bless.